How good, STS back in the saddle for another Thursday morning. Going to be honest, slightly fatigued. She's been a big lift from me over the last couple of days. Went along to Fred again. Got to say, what a concert that was as well. An unreal gig. What a talented bloke. On the keyboard, singing on his tools as well. The decks or whatever they're called. They probably have a technical name. But he was an unreal performance. What a roost he is. Seems like a great lad as well. So that was a heck of a concert. And if you went along to Sparker over the last couple of nights hope you enjoyed that as well backed her up with 4am starts on your George FM breakfast each morning so fair to say your boy Surly's putting in the hard yards she's a short week though Easter long weekend so you just got to put your head down take these tough carries and on we march still here today I'm ready to talk you through all the latest things in sport she's a big episode as well Bryn Hall jumping on to talk all things super rugby and then so much going on in the NRL world so can't wait to rip into that shout out to the TAB as always headline sponsor of this podcast and if you are having a flutter this weekend you're having a cheeky little punt then please make sure you download the TAB app or head along to their website www.tab.co.nz it's the home of sport and racing punting here in New Zealand and we really appreciate their support but without further ado there's plenty to get into so let's get amongst it only one undefeated team remaining in the competition with the Cowboys sitting alone. The cream of the crop so far. Three wins, zero defeats. So well done to Todd Payton's lads. Then at the other end of the ladder, you got two teams that are still yet to get their first dub of the year. So tough scenes for the Titans and the Bunnies. In terms of your talking points from last week, gee, she's a bad week to be a physio. Hamstrings, fractures, brain cell depletions, injuries through the roof. Star players as well, dropping like flies. I can't remember a weekend quite like it. At least 15 big names all gone. The Luxia Clary's, Walsh. Moses, pain in the house. Tino Faasua Malawi unfortunately did his ACL. So you can pretty much put a line through the Titans. Even tough as nails, Tane went down with concussion. So you know when he's out, it's a real Daryl Tuffy. Shout out to Albert Hopawari as well, who actually burnt his arm while cooking dinner earlier in the week. So he is unable to play. Some elite scenes there, real battler of the week stuff. But great news for the Warriors. We actually potentially welcome back three big names from last week into our 17 but more on that soon in terms of the Panthers as well speaking of Nathan Cleary some good news for them they've been confirmed as the first team to head across to Vegas in 2025 surely the Warriors we follow suit next Wars in Vegas it's just meant to be they thought this year was elite with the fans traveling if you want to get real bums on seats chuck the Wars in the mixer whether it's the World Club Challenge final or round zero we know that the Kiwis will flock over there truly the best fans in the comp so let's make that happen I think all teams are set to be announced in the next two weeks so keep your fingers toes everything crossed for that your big results from last week Panthers smoked the Broncos I think everyone saw that coming but unfortunately Cleary he pulled his hamster so he's going to be out for four to six weeks the Roosters made absolute mincemeat of their arch rivals in the bunnies embarrassing scenes for the Rabbitohs of course it was Jared Waria Hargraves 300th James Tedesco arguably in the best form of his career when many people were starting to question whether he should be wearing the sky blue or whether he should even be wearing the one jersey for the Roosters with all the options they have in their outside backs but Teddy's going great guns the Bunnies now conceded in their last three games over 112 points that's averaging over 38 points per game they're coming dead last it's the first time they've sat on the bottom of the ladder since 2010 and I see this week coach Jason Demetrio he's resisted temptation to roll the wholesale changes basically starting cook back at hooker but that is it me personally I think it's time to go Cody Walker at seven Jackie Boy Wyden at six and see if that changes anything they're up shit creek without a paddle at the moment and you'd have to think JD if they don't get the win this week against the doggies a team that typically and historically they've had the wood over 
then perhaps he could well be on the chopping block. Speaking of the doggies, well done to them. Showed up in a major way and got a famous win. Friend of the show, Josh Curran, going great guns over there. The old mulleted menace, 32-0 against the Titans. Poor old Titans, they've only scored six points across their two games so far. They do get back Jaden Campbell and potentially David Fafita this week, so maybe positive signs on the horizon. But like I touched on before, Tino dropping out, a massive loss for them. The Cowboys, they pumped the Dragons, no surprises there. The Tigers... Where did that come from? Unreal scenes. What a difference a week can make. A 32 points to 6 demolishing of the Sharks. Benji gets his first dub. A couple young bucks really stood up for me. I thought Lockie Galvin was unreal. 18 years old. What a footballer he is. And then Jareem Buller, a.k.a. Ivor Jareem Buller-Vanaka. These two well and truly look to be the future of the Tigers' spine, I thought. Api Corusel was unreal. Surely he wears the nine for New South Wales starting. And then new recruit Justin Ollum. He lived up to all the hype and certainly delivered for his new side. Then the Eels, they came back from 14-0 on your Super Sunday to hand the Manly Gulls their first loss. Shout out to young centre Blaze Tualangi on debut. What a first name Blaze is. That right there screams a bloke who's set to play rugby league football. He looks a handful, wearing the six jersey this week with their injury to Mitch Moses, so keen to see how he goes. But well done to the young lad. And then the Knights, they scraped home over the storm. 14 points to 12, a storm side without four of their biggest names. It was tough scenes for the Knights. Pretty dusty code from both teams, to be fair. A real poo slinger to round out the round, but it does have me excited for this week when the Warriors get to take on the Knights. Speaking of the Warriors of course they got their first dub of the season our lads the one New Zealand Warriors 18-10 over the Raiders rolled down to the 0-3 in front of a sold out crowd and got the job done interesting game arguably our weakest performance out of the three so far but like I touched on last week the Raiders they love to pull you into an arm wrestle they pay that python type of footy where they just try strangle you into a real boar fest not a lot of points plenty of errors from both teams but we get the win and shit was it a much needed two points as well we made it harder on ourselves then probably it needed to be we blew two tries just through drawing passes where I think both players would love to have that opportunity again. And saying that though, we showed some great attacking structure. That first try for Adam was just beautiful. Like I spoke about over the last couple of weeks, that triple dip shape that we've been running. This one a slight variation. You give the ball to the big fella, Shakira hips. They still don't lie. And it got me thinking, is Adam's try celebration arguably the coolest one going round in the comp at the moment the old shoulder shrug the old what's going on this is just too easy for me cool to see we can score off improv play as well Dallin just tracking across field nothing doing cedar doom to Lukey Metcalf didn't know Dell had that type of ball playing in his arsenal and from there Lukey Met just turned on the jets and dotted down for the meaty Raiders they're a gritty team they love to just drag you down see how far you can go and see what you're made of so cool to see we tick that box and just show that this year we're the real deal we can win pretty we can win ugly so great scenes there for your standouts thought Adam unreal yet again 160 meters in 48 minutes Mitch Barnett he was elite as well what a deadly propping duo those two are they're a heck of a one-two punch and once you chuck Marata back into the mixer this weekend then that is some scary shit for opposition middles Rocco going from strength to strength, really starting to become a fan favourite, and it's cool to see he's now getting that recognition, not only from Warriors fans and internally from people in the club who always knew that he was this talented, but now that wider NRL audience, pundits from overseas, over in Aussie, they're starting to see just how talented this bloke is on attack. He's got plenty of razzle about him, he's strong, he's quick as well, and he's a strong distributor on defence. He can chop anyone, loves an ankle tackle, I'm going to start calling him bootlaces, Barry. Doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Sifa Talakai, Dane Gagai, if you run at Rocco, you're going to get chopped all day long. So well done to him. I thought Tane was unreal up until his head knock. Unfortunate to see him go off there. 46 minutes, 122 run meters, five tackle breaks. The kids a gun. Then the bloke who moved into the one jersey for him. I thought he was elite. RTS, individual brilliance from him for that try, just to remind the haters 
is that he is still one of the best attacking threats going around in the comp. It was cool to see the lads as well. Just how fizz they were for Roger to score his first meaty with that Warriors logo back on his left tip. Nothing doing. Give him the ball and watch him go to work. 200 meters, a try, 71 PCMs, five tackle breaks. That right there, ladies and gentlemen, is our strike centre. I thought SJ's kicking game was exceptional yet again. Lukey Metz's ball playing and support play was right up there. Good to see him go 100% off the kicking tee as well, while SJ still manages a couple of those niggles going on in his lower limbs off the Rimu. I thought Ale and Jazz were massive for us off the bench, giving us that impact. Of course, Dylan Walker, he was a late scratching. I was a bit worried when he got removed because so often that bench really gives us that punch and that momentum that we need to come away with the dub. But I thought Jazz in particular really stood up for the absence of walks. 101 metres and 27 tackles in 34 minutes. An absolute shift from him and then my STS man of the match and I gotta give it to our mulleted winger Dallin Wateni Zelezniak Jesus he a tough customer of course so known around the league for those crazy try scoring finishes that he can pull off but I think it's underrated some of the tough carries he does to kick off our sets out of yardage he just sprints no regard for his body zero handbrake reminds me almost of Carmichael Hunt from back in his Broncos days he gets knocked around a little but every time he's straight back up to play the ball did a massive shot as well did his best Kane Evans impersonation and folded that Raiders wing I can't remember quite who it was forced an error though and then that seed for Metcalf like we touched on before then that was Steve Devine shout out as well to our skipper Tohu 50 tackles just two misses another 80 minute shift an absolute workhorse good to see him get recognised as well with some Dally M points I'd like to think I claim that course mentioned on the pod a couple weeks back that he deserves some recognition because so often he gets snubbed this week six points of the best Matty Tomoko with two Jordan Rapana with two Dallin with one and RTS with one so you can't complain with those points wasn't pretty but two points is two points. Sometimes you just have to get the job done. And that's what we did against a side who so often doesn't lose games like that. And Ricky Stewart's lads. Add to that, our outs. No Walker with the late pull. Wade, he was pulled 24 hours out as well. Marata, Chans, losing Tane. So Capewell had to move to the centres. We faced plenty of adversity, but we got it done. So on we march. Moving forward to this week, tonight we get treated to a game that in the preseason you'd have to say had some of the biggest names in the game lacing up for your Thursday night footy on Easter weekend. It was a tick in every box. Unfortunately, of course, no Nathan Cleary, no James Fisher-Harris for the Panthers, no Sorensen either. Chooks, though, they're pretty much full strength. I think they're without Lindsay Collins and a couple other forwards as well. But this should still be a heck of a game. Both teams playing good code at the moment, the Roosters in particular. I think this is an important game for them to win. They'll go in favourites. Panthers with nothing to lose. Their record without Nathan Cleary as well is actually a lot better than people assume. So maybe that could be a banana skin game. Tomorrow night, you've got the Bunnies taking on the Dogs. Bunnies, desperate dogs, full of fizz after that win last week. So they'll be liking their odds to go out there and do some humping. Then you've got the Broncos Cows, the Battle of Queensland. Unfortunately, of course, for the Bronx, they are without Reese Walsh and Payne Haas, but they do welcome back their inspirational skipper and Adam Reynolds. The Cowboys, they're at full strength, so I think they could rock up to Suncorp and continue their undefeated streak. Super Saturday, Dragons taking on the Gulls, Titans taking on the Finns. Expect both of those to be high-scoring games. Two poo slingers as well, although I do really enjoy watching Manly go about their work, so that could be worth tuning in for. Sunday, Warriors Knights, that'll be a beauty, and Sharks versus Raiders. And then on your Monday, how good is that? Easter Monday, long weekend, starting to wind down you're starting to think about work on Tuesday you're dreading it you turn on the telly and what do you see some Monday night code put the feet up crack open a better beer and life is good again Eels Tigers that should be an interesting one no Mitchie Moses for the Eels blazing the halves as I spoke to before so the Tigers they might like their odds to pull off back to back dubs and it seems that Benji's got them full of confidence so that will be a good watch but of course my STS feature match for this week the one you you all tune in to hear my thoughts on is the Warriors taking on the Knights Easter Sunday out at the Fortress Go Media Stadium 
fingers crossed the sun's shining. They do have an alcohol license as well, which is always tricky around Easter. She's tough to buy your beers. Can't do so on a Friday or a Sunday. But the good folks at the Warriors, they've ticked all the boxes and you will be able to rip into a couple of Waitakere daiquiris while you watch the game. Few changes for this week. Webby, he's been able to welcome back a few troops. One injury forced, and then some big names back on deck, which is great signs for the club. You got Roger, the snack. Tui Vaswa Shek back in the one jersey. Many people have been calling for it for weeks, and I completely understand and agree with why we haven't been doing so. Tane, he's been unreal, but unfortunately, brain cell depletion, so he has to miss that 10 day mandatory stand down. So Webby's hand was forced. Chance, he's not ready to play again. Big chat, though, that he will be back next week for that trip across the ditch to take on the Bunnies, who hopefully are 0 and 4. So I look forward to seeing him back out on the the paddock but Roger he gets an opportunity to wear the one jersey which he put in that Dallium winning season and the baby cows they'll be oiled up ready to go and they'll be put out on display left foot goosey catch you later I expect him to be at his menacing best and it's just going to be so good to see him get his hands on the ball a bit more with time and space and let's see what happens Adam Pompey he comes back into the centres he'll join bootlaces Barry wins that battle with Ali Leotoa which a few people were surprised with as well I think people are quick to forget though Adam played every game for us last year he's a quality footballer and I think he's going to really enjoy this opportunity to go out there and prove that he is still well and truly a first grader. Good to see Wado, CEO of Ruck Manipulation, named in the nine jersey. Fingers crossed he can get out on the paddock and play just because what he does to our attack and I think this is a game where potentially we could really turn it on and score some points. So it'd be good to have our maestro out there pulling the strings and helping out the Prince of Penrose. Marata, Welcome back, son. Recovered from that foot fracture, and he is good to go. We got a glimpse in that second trial against Redcliffe of just how effective he is going to be in that new role he's going to play. Off the bench, middle of the park, big body. We now have that rotation of Adam Fenua Blake, Mitchy Barnett, Marata Niakore. Three big humans, three aggressive blokes as well, who will run hard and tackle all day long. So I'm expecting some big shots from those three, and I know Marata, he will be itching to get back out there and make another statement unfortunately that does mean no room for Jazz or Tome Ale, who I spoke on before, has both been really effective off the Rimu. Walks comes back, so he is good to go. Freddie Lusick with Bunty Afoa and Marata, they make up our bench. So tough calls there. Perhaps, personally, I would have looked at it a slightly different way, but I am not your Dallium Coach of the Year, so in Webby we trust. And this is a bloody good team. It's nice to see health. It's coming back into our favour, and these are the tough calls that Andrew Webster is going to be faced with every week. On the flip side though, it's so much better than having to scrape together a 17 and not having confidence in your whole squad. So exciting times ahead for Warriors fans. In terms of the Knights, for me, I think they've been massive fallers so far this year. They've been real patchy and a bit clunky on attack. I almost think of them as last year's Cowboys. They went great the year before. They come into the year full of confidence. Experts expecting them just to pick up from where they were at the end of last season, but it hasn't quite clicked for them. They've already rolled out a new halves combo. Leo Thompson, he faces suspension this week, so their middle is going to be a little weakened as well. I think we're going to bash them up the guts and then spread it wide, and I'm personally predicting a bit of a replay from last year's semi-final. They rocked up to me out smart full of confidence we put 40 odd on them this week I think we do it again we've seen glimpses so far we haven't quite seen that full performance last week I said it was going to be last week this week I'm saying it's going to be this week but I truly think that that is the case and we could be in for absolute scenes on your Sunday Arvo what more could you want so get along I think there's still a few tickets left bums on seats is absolutely required they're our national team Warriors 13 plus you know the drill and see you out in Penrose happy days the great man Bryn Hall joining us from Japan bro first of all how's things lad and I see you got a famous win on the weekend over a couple ex All Blacks as well so life must be sitting pretty at the moment yeah konnichiwa Ben yeah obviously um, Japan's very good at the moment we've got a uh, a couple of days off which is nice and yeah we played against 
uh, the Toyota Ver Blitz with Aaron Smith and, and, and Bowden Barrett. And yeah, thankfully, we uh, we got the win. So I think we're four from four in the last Ooh. two years whenever it rains, whenever it rains. So I think that might be the blueprint for us to get a bit of rain in, in Japan because we tend to go pretty good in the rain. We're the specialist, eh? You've also got guys like uh, Charles Piertau and co in your team as well. So you guys must be pretty handy. What's the style of footy like? Because I see highlights and whatnot. We don't get too many games on TV over here. I think there's one a week, but looks fast. looks like you have to be fit and there's a lot of points scored. Yeah, probably defense is secondary in the uh, Japanese <laughs> top league, um, especially for not the not the top teams like your Panasonic and um, your Toshibas. But mm. yeah, it's a great brand of footy over here. I think um, you know, there's been a lot said in, I think, New Zealand at the moment around ball and play and being able to try um, make the game a little bit better when it comes to temper and whatnot. But yeah, there's a lot of ball and play here in Japan. I think we had our game against Toshiba, uh, against Toyota was 44 minutes ball and play, which is you know a pretty big number considering mm. it was raining as well. And um, I think the level as well is getting a lot better. You see a lot of, you know, a lot of South African, Australians, New Zealanders. You know, you look at Richard Mwanga, who's over here at the moment, who arguably could be one of the better tens for around the world, playing in his prime over here in Japan. So, yeah, it's a great, it's a great competition, and um, you also get four or five months off if you um, if you don't make seniors or whatnot, or even if you do, you get a good good break. So, yeah, it's been really good for me and Sam, my my, my partner, and um, you're looking to stay over here a few more years and and get on the, and keep on this yen run. That's the one, bro. Got to got to make the hay while the sun's shining. Of course, you're still heavily invested in Super Rugby through your work with Sky and then just because you love your code, mate. You're an absolute code pig. So I thought I'd chill, talk to you about the New Zealand teams and how they're tracking so far. We'll start with the Canes. I assume everyone probably thought I'd ask about the Crusaders first, but we'll start at the top and uh, make our way there. I'll, I'll try warm you up a bit, but mate, undefeated. They're going great guns at the moment. They have arguably the best half-back duo in the competition in terms of starting and then off the bench, maybe even in the world. Do you see any kind of clinks in their armour or do you think they're just the team to beat at the moment? Ben, I really appreciate you actually not starting with the Crusaders because I tend to do that a lot on my podcast. Ross yeah. actually right, jumps into the 0-4, and 0-3 and, and kind of continues that with the Crusaders spiel at the moment. So I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, look, mate, the Hurricanes are... Um, are a well settled side. I actually picked them as my dark horse to to win the competition. And I think for me, the things that you did talk around Cam Roygaard and TJ Pedernada, look that um that combination I think will flourish throughout the year. And you know it's going to be interesting to see which way they do go with two great halfbacks. And you even look at TJ on the weekend with the way he played. Look, he's going to be knocking on the door and knowing how competitive he is. But I think for that for the for the Hurricanes team, they're pretty settled in more of so the the years that that team's been together, you look at probably their loose four trio, their tight five, they've played four or five years. And I look at the depth in it of their, of their, of their flankers. You know, you've got obviously Larkai, Dubasi, Karifu, Flanders, Brendan, Brendan, Ayose is obviously a great, um, who's had a great start to the end. And I think when it comes to the attrition rate of the loose forwards and super rugby, having a, the depth that they do have is going to be really good for them moving forward. And I think they've always had a great back line and they'll continue to keep getting better. Ruben Love, the depth that they have at their second five centers, um, you know, Brett Cameron, I think with the combination with Ruby Love and Roy Guard, or even if it's Pedro Nara, they've got a great spine. So I think they've got all the ingredients of, of being able to win the championship. And I think depth is going to be really important. If you have depth at the back end of the competition, which we've seen, um, they had 14 changes against the, against the Rebels and, you know, they didn't miss, miss a beat. So yeah, they're looking pretty good. And um, I guess for them, it's just been able to peak at the right end of the year. Some teams, I think, in the last two years, you look at the Blues and the Chiefs, mm -hmm. probably peaked early in the year, and then kind of the back end of the season, the Crusaders came over the top. But yeah, I think at the moment, um, on form with how they've started, yeah, the Hurricanes are, are sitting pretty long with the Chiefs, I reckon. You mentioned those 14 changes on the weekend, and that was kind of the final box tick for me because so often you see like top teams roll out the changes against the side like the Rebels, who you could easily drop down to their standards, but it seems like the competition's so high for spots that if you get an opportunity and you don't play to the best of your ability, you're just not going to get another crack again. Does that kind of confirm to you even more that they're ready this year? Because they could have easily just scraped past the Rebels, but they put them to the sword. Yeah, I think it comes to a, any good environment when, you know, you get you, there or thereabouts for the championship is having the depth. And I think the competitiveness within training, you look at, you know, the guys that were given opportunities and, you know, playing really well. So I think firstly, um, having the depth in the squad that I alluded to is really important, but then you've got to go out and perform. And that comes back to what the coaches and what the players are driving within that, within that, within that unit and that team. So 
Um, injuries can always happen at the back end of the year, but like I said, their depth that they have when you can have 14 changes and, and bar it be a Rebels team that is struggling, um, you still got to go out there and put the performance like they did on the weekend. And um, I'd hate to be a coach to yeah. see that 23. It's going to be a tough selection uh, moving forward in the next couple of weeks. Another team that's pretty stacked throughout the squad is the Chiefs. There's rumours D-Mac won't even be lacing up this week, but in comes like a Josh Ioane to to run the cutter, which is pretty stacked. For me, they appear to be the second best team in the competition with D-Mac arguably in the best form of his career. Is that how you see it at the moment? Guys like Jacobson, Tupo Vai, Sam Penny Finau all playing elite. Are the Chiefs kind of that next tier behind the Canes? Um, for me, I've actually got I've got the I've got the Chiefs sitting first. I think oh. I know they're not on the table and the hurry the Hurricanes are, are first mm. and can warrant obviously the discussions of being favourites, but I just think the body of work that the Chiefs have done over a long period of time probably sets them well moving up to, moving to this year. I know that they're not they're not first, but um, the way that they're playing, it's really hard to be able to to be able to defend and to, to contain, especially with the way that they do play. I know they had a little hiccup and didn't get that one against the Reds, but mm. I think they've got the best attack in the competition when it comes to their face play shape. Um, you know, Damien McKenzie, if you can get him good go forward ball and the collision area, which they do very, very well in Chiefs in Chiefs country, look at the first half, 28 points, oh. um, just due to being able to just absolutely dominate people. And they've got the the cattle in form in turn of their, their forward pack to be able to do that. So I've got the Chiefs sitting there nicely. And I think the experience of, you know, being in finals footy and, you know, not winning the final last year, um, you know, as you as you know, Benny, mate, when you don't win finals, you come back the next year and you want to try and rectify that and be able to have a little, little bit more fire in the belly, knowing it, it's it's pretty close. And I think they've got a settled squad. It's a very settled squad. And as long as Damien McKenzie's playing, I think he's very similar to what Richie Moonga was at the Crusaders, and he's probably a guy I think in the competition is um, very Richie esque in 2024. Kind of that next tier down now, because you could argue Canes and Chiefs are right up there together, but it does seem like there's a little bit of a drop-off, and that's where I'd kind of put the Blues at the moment in that third to fourth type of bracket. Do you agree with that? Guys like Hoskins and that are playing some unreal code, but I think we saw even in the first half on the weekend, they can take a little bit of time to adapt to the different ways they want to play, and against <coughs> the top teams, they could just be gone by then, you know, put you to the sword. Yeah, it is an interesting case. I think, you know, they have done pretty well points wise to be to be where they are. But I think the you know, a lot of people can fall into the trap around early, early, early in the season being able to say the um who the best team right now is going to be the best team come um at the end. And I think for the Blues, you know, they are picking up wins and probably not playing the consistent brand of footy that, you know, they would like, but they're picking up wins and I guess through the duration of the competition you can evolve and you can understand what your DNA looks like. And I think the, the ingredients that I'm really been impressed with them is their forward pack and their willingness to be able to work um, and doing all the all the one percenters and all the unseen stuff that you're not accustomed to seeing. And I guess probably being in Auckland, um, you know, you're used to seeing the flair, the X Factor, your Caleb Clarks, Rico Ioannis, your Kitty Ioannis, and all Hoskins to do even on that attacking side. But they can they get into their work and when they when they're humming their their gain line percentage that they do have, um, they're the best in the competition. So. I don't see that changing. I just think picking up wins now, and like I said, when you get into that back end of the tournament, I think they are they have ingredients right now which they're improving, especially their breakdown and collision area. Um, if they continue to keep doing that, and um, they'll evolve in their attack, and whether that's contestable kicking game or Perifeta, Finlay Christie, and that kind of wet game that we saw against um, the Crusaders. But now they'll just be picking up wins, and obviously they have a new coach as well. So I think they'll have a um, they'll be there or thereabouts come at the back end of the season. Landers have been a team I've enjoyed to watch so far. That back three is mm. full of so much razzle. The young bloke, Jacob Ratamatavuki Nepkins, like he's worth just watching just to see him go about his work for the 80 minutes. And I think we saw on the weekend they've established a bit of a culture there. They're a young team, but 28 nil down, like you said, they were getting bashed in defense. Like the Chiefs were just loading up and putting in some big shots. It'd be so easy to roll over, but that pride in the jersey got them back into the game. Have they kind of surprised you? I think. I think I kind of thought this is a two to three year project, but it looks like they're not that far off kind of pushing these top teams. Yeah, they're not that far off. And I think, you know, picking up wins early, early in the season was pretty important for them. And they had a really good preseason. They went undefeated and had that kind of continuity early doors, which gives you confidence going into the start of the season. I guess their challenge is, is going to be they probably can't afford a lot of injuries. You know, if they had the similarity of the Crusaders and having that many injuries, then, you know, it's probably a different story. So, you know, touch wood for the people down in, in Dunedin, uh, for the Highlanders country, that they do, um, they don't get a lot of injuries because I think the depth and probably in the top three New Zealand teams, I think um, they can't afford to do that. But, 
Yeah, I think the X factor is a big thing that um, that's been really important for them. I think in the last couple of years, haven't had that um, tava tava na wai or nipkins and atava tavuki like you're talking about to be able to try and beat people one on one. I think they've always grafted really hard, and they'll continue to keep doing that. You've got Jamie Joseph who who's there who. We both, uh, who I know is obviously works really hard and heard that kind of stern edge and around around the camp. So, yeah, I've been really really impressed with them. I think just injuries will be will be massive for them. And I think there's obviously uh, Reese Patchell and Falau Fakatabe had, had really strong start to the season. But you've also got AJ Falia Fanga, who I think um, has matured really well in the past five weeks. Has been given opportunities off the bench, and he's probably one guy that I think um, has a big future moving forward. So, yeah, really excited about the Highlanders, and hopefully they can. Um, continue their their growth and uh, can stay injury free for the season. Right, let's rip the band-aid off, bro, and talk about the Crusaders. Obviously, you're heavily invested still with your heart, and you know a lot of the lads really well. So I'm sure it kind of hurts you to watch this from afar. But what do you kind of put this start down to? Obviously, the injury toll is massive, and I think people are kind of sweeping that under the rug at the moment and just kind of piling on all these other factors. But you watch them on the weekend, like set piece that's been a cornerstone of your guys game for so long line out time was a real struggle is it inexperience is it change of coaching is it the injuries or is it just the fact that they're zero and five and everything just seems like really hard for them at the moment yeah i think it's a combination of all that benny i think mm. you know let's you know start at the start of the season i know there's been players that have left throughout the duration of like raises tenure and you left players had left left the squad um at, at different times in that seven years but you know, when you lose a guy like Richie Mwanga and Sam Whitelock, those are probably two pillars, I think, that were um, behind massively with the success um, of the Crusaders during that um, that title run. And, you know, anytime you lose world-class players like that, um, you know, it's tough. And I think also as well, you know, losing Fergus Burke early in Mighty 10 Cup uh, for the Crusaders and not having that 10 to be able to come in um, was really tough. And I think you look on the weekend, the set piece, the set piece was, which, which you said, I think, um, is something that you're not accustomed to seeing with the Crusaders. But, you know, you look at the hooker, you know, George Bell, 21, Jamie Hanna, Taylor Cahill, 21, you know, Dom Gardner's 23, you know, um, the reserves that came on, Seb Calder and the hooker, 21, 23, you know, so sometimes you just need that old, that old man strength mm. um, and experience to be able to try and win. Um, the, the contact area, I think, is a, is a big part. And if you look at the top three New Zealand teams, the, the Blues, Chiefs and Hurricanes, the gain line percentage and the physicality areas, um, they're winning them more so than not. And I think that's an area where the Crusaders are struggling. And then that's in turn going to the clunkiness in their attack, which, you know, we're not seeing them beating defenders beating a lot because, you know, that gain line area is really, really, uh, really tough at the moment. So, yeah, I think it's a baptism of fire, unfortunately, Benny. It's really hard to say that as a Crusaders man. But, you know, when you've got a lot of young guys that are in there trying to to learn, learn on the job, uh, you're probably seeing like results that they are at the moment. And I think they're picking up injuries you know, every single week, it seems, Scott Barrett one week, you've got David Harvilli, who I think I'm not too sure has a calf injury, but, you know, you're losing key key cogs of that wheel and experience every single week. So the bike can't come at a better time. I know they've got the Chiefs on the weekend and, and hopefully as a Crusaders man, that can change. But um, when that bike comes, they've got a bit of cavalry coming back and, you know, for the best of this competition, you know, you only need to finish eighth in this competition. There's 12 teams and you only need to pick up, you know, possibly five wins. So um, with that cavalry coming back, who knows what can happen and, you know, I think if you if you if we're being honest, you know, and you finish eight, you finish first, and you play the Crusaders in eighth, um, you probably don't want to you play a Crusaders team with all the cavalry coming back again if they do make the top eight. Hundred percent. You mentioned uh, old man strength there in in Whitelock and Co. And your mate Razor's been in the headlines again this week. And I saw you caught up with him the other day as well, which must have been cool just to chew the fat. But what did you make of this whole wanting to bring him back? I get it in terms of experience or whatnot. Are you a fan of this? Are you a fan of the international eligibility? Because he's already ruffled a few feathers and suggested a few things. So be keen to get your opinion on whether you think those overseas guys should be eligible for All Blacks and would, would Whitelock coming out of retirement be a good thing for the All Blacks, or do you think it's time to invest in the future? Yeah, it's, it's definitely got to raise um, DNA all over his imprints of being able to to do something like this. I just think, um, just knowing what Sam can do, I know you know there's been talks around if it's good or bad, but the experience that that guy will have um, for the group is massive. And you know, whenever we were at the Crusaders, and this is going a little bit off topic, but a guy called Tim Bateman when we were there. He didn't play a lot of minutes. You know, he's not guys that were, he was, he's not a guy that was in the headlines consistently throughout the tenure that he was there. But mm. the stuff that he did behind the scenes with with the, with the non-playing group, uh, with the management, uh, being able to keep guys engaged and being able to help them off the field, with, especially with the young guys and how important that is. 
it led to a lot of our success and it doesn't get talked about enough. So I know Sam can still play and whether he wants to come back on a one or two year transition period for the World Cup to help these young locks coming through, I see it as, as a great way to do it. But then you've also got the experience if he does play, you can use him in, in crucial moments like you saw him in that World Cup coming off the bench and being able to, to close out games. So um, I'm not too sure if it's true, um, but I can definitely see the benefit of bringing in a guy like that with like the points that I touched on um, with a guy like Tim Bateman, how invaluable he was during our, our title run and what he did for the hot behind the scenes for us. In terms of the international eligibility, would you like to see it come in? Like, do you think there needs to be a threshold, a certain number of All Blacks caps so that we don't lose so much talent here or else people are going to chase the money overseas early, aren't they? Or would you like to yeah. see it just a, a clean slate? What's your opinion? Or do you think we should just stick with how it is at the moment? Because you touched on Richie Moanga before. Guys like Leicester it would be so good to have them in the All Blacks still. Yeah, it's, it's a double-edged sword. You know, I think... Um, you know, we'd all love, you know, Richie or, you know, guys that have gone a little bit earlier to be able to eligible, to be able to come back and play for New Zealand. But yeah. I think at the same time, what's made us so great has been able to keep the talent in New Zealand. And, you know, that's led into Super Rugby Pacific now or just Super Rugby in, in general to be able to have a really strong competition. But I think with with where we are, uh, we're not the world leading, world leading team anymore. We're not world leading. We're not innovating. We're not changing the game. We're almost trying to go to the normal Northern Hemisphere and being able to grab that IP and that knowledge of what's been done over there with what I believe is probably um, the most consistent and um, competitive Six Nations. I think that's the most competitive uh, competitive World Rugby at Bar World Cup. So, um, and knowing Razor and his thinking, he's always a step ahead. And like you said in the media, he's brought conversations around, you know, we, we might be able to be picked from overseas. So I think a good O-Law would be a good compromise if we did go that route. I think, you know, if you need to be able to earn your stripes in New Zealand, I believe, whether that's playing, it's, it's playing Super Rugby and then, you know, and, and, a cap quota of 50 or 60 test matches i think a 70 to 80 would be would be pretty good knowing that's you know at least seven or eight years in new zealand that you've invested into the all black jersey and, and a lot of time at super rugby to get then given the chance to go and enjoy an experience like a sabbatical like a boda barrett and a Adi severe doing right now but i'm able to be able to possibly go on a three-year deal like richard mwanga has and still be able to play for the all blacks because you're really you've reached a quota of certain caps of um for the all blacks Finally, before I let you go, bro, talking All Blacks, in terms of bolters or standouts from Super Rugby so far, has there been anyone that you think's really put their hand up and would have caught Razor's attention? Because there are quite a few vacancies there this year. It's going to look quite different to teams of the past. Yeah, it's, it's a really good one. Um, I think for me, just personally, the halfbacks is, is, is a great debate. You know, with Aaron Smith leaving, um, there's a lot of guys and I think a lot of flexibility that I think Ray could go. I think, you know, you've obviously got um, Cam Roy going, who I think is the form halfback in the competition, arguably could be the best player in Super Rugby right now with the way that he's performed. Um, you've got Finlay Christie, who's obviously floated around in and around um, the last couple of years. Um, you've got Cortez Ratima and Xavier Rowe with that Chiefs combination. Obviously, Xavier Rowe got the start for the start of the year, but Cortez has come on really well, and I know that there's a, a lot of hype around him in New Zealand. And then you obviously got Falau Fakatava with Aaron Smith leaving, um, he's a guy that obviously is going to be able to get a lot of a lot of time and a lot of minutes to be able to grow his uh, grow as a halfback. So the halfback ranks for me is actually a really good one um, for me. But I think lastly, one guy that's really impressed me has been Ruben Love. I think with what he's done, I know Sean Stevenson is probably the incumbent with with Will Jordan not being out. And I think he probably deserves um, a start at, in the fullback position with knowing what he's done at Super Rugby level. But a guy like Ruben Love. Man, his his triple threat, his ability to be able to run, kick, pass, especially his distribution under pressure, I think is pretty world class and it's something unique that he has. So he's probably one guy I think would be a bolter um, for the. I don't even know if he's going to be a bolter. I think with how way he's playing and um, a few injuries in the outside backs. So yeah, Ruben Love in the halfbacks um, has been something that I've been looking at a lot. Yeah, 100%. And then lastly, before I let you go, I said finally before, but mate, no doubt you've been in touch with old Blakey, the coat, 2-0 and in pre-season, mate. We're, we're mimicking that kind of Highlanders form from pre-season, which suggests all signs are pointing towards a championship. Are you hearing rumours over in Japan that it is actually Northcote's year and the boys will be off to Mudbrook on Monday running a Mad Monday celebration, surely? Yeah, massively. Yeah, obviously getting the, getting the report every single week from Blakey, and um, he's obviously still doing the hard yards, doing the old Hamilton Hamilton bus trips in the yeah in the, in the field in the preseason. So um, you know that comes back to him as, as a coat man, obviously a leader mm. within the coat um, coat ranks. But yeah, obviously, mate, two and zero, and looking forward to seeing um, the mighty coat get back to where they deserve and, um, and winning championships. So now look forward to the weekly report from Blake and 
um, yourself as well. So and I look forward to seeing how you see how you boys go throughout the year. And uh, when you come back to visit, rumours you're going to lace up this year, not just uh, tease the boys, rock up and run the waters like you did last year. Surely you'll be ripping a few seeds out there. I might even get the start at 10 just for old times' sake if they go the sentimental route, mate. you got to do me a favour here. You should bring a lot of experience. What are we doing? Yeah. A lot of experience in our age yeah. these days. Um, but no, I'll, I'll be back a little bit earlier. So Ooh. last year I kind of did a six-week um, Europe trip with my partner and mm. we're not doing that this year, so... No, I'd love to get back, and I think you know if Blakey's there, and um, even if it's twenty minutes off the pine, mate, it'd be great to be able to put that uh, that golden maroon back on, mate. We'd love oh. to put it on, mate. That's enough for me. Well, really appreciate your time, horse, especially on your day off. You could be other places out seeing the sights or enjoying some of the local cuisine, but you're here spinning some shans with Surly, mate. So really appreciate it, and uh, good luck for the rest of your season as well, bro. Hopefully that uh, undefeated in the rain streak can can march on and you'll go better than your old team the crusaders had to get a parting jab in there mate but go well i appreciate it Benny. always a pleasure thanks mate hunting chat time now where of course we open up the tab app we jump on their website and we search for some options that'll give us green ticks on our bet slips this weekend in your nrl plenty of juicy options to get on your promos your power plays your boosts so make sure you head along to the punters lounge to check all the promotions that are available same game claims your oval ball mega multi busters your surly talk sports boost you'll find it all there so sink your teeth in tonight Chooks versus Panthers. Chooks go in $1.60 favourites and fair enough too. Some interesting stats though. The Panthers have won their last eight games against the Roosters, but the Roosters in return have won seven of their past nine games at home. For your try scorers, Domi Young, he scored a try in five of his last six games. And James Tedesco, he scored a double last week and has scored in three of his last four home games against the Panthers. So for me, I like the Chooks to win this one in a tight one. And I think a good same game claim here would be Domi Young. And then I'm chucking in Taruva from the Panthers. He scored eight tries in his last seven games. The Panthers, they're going to score a meaty. So fingers crossed, it's the young Fijian flyer. Bunnies, dogs, bunnies, they'll be desperate. But the stats certainly suggest that they could be in for a win. They've won their last five straight against the Doggies. The Rabbitohs have also scored 30 points plus points in all five of those games. Interestingly enough as well, AJ, we all know he loves a media. He scored two or more tries in his last three games against them. He's paying $1.72 anytime. He's paying $4.35 for two or more. So a bit of jam around that. Then if you want to really get Ivan Leary in three out of South's last five games, the opposition starting left wing has been the first try scorer. So if you rack that up, you run across the team sheets, then that suggests that Connor Tracy from the Bulldogs could well be a good chance to score your first meaty. 13 bucks, real specialist stat there, one for the sickos, but there could be some jam and some real value. Battle of Queensland, Bronx taking on the cows. I like the cows here to get the win at $1.79. They're aiming for their first 4 and 0 start of the season since 2007. And again, another purist stat. I'm pulling out the doozies this week, but Jeremiah Nunai, he's been the first try scorer in each of the Cowboys' last Last two games against Brisbane at Suncorp. Surely that's an omen. He's paying 15 of the best. The big second rower from North Queensland. Dragons versus Gulls. Going manly here. Don't need to explain myself there, surely. Titans versus Finns. Normally I'd say this one would be a point scoring fest, but like I touched on before, Gold Coast have only scored one try in 160 minutes of footy. They do get back Jaden Campbell, son of Preston, all know he's a weapon, so he could be due to help boost up their attacking flair. If David Fafita's in the mixer as well, then he is always an asset, but the Gold Coast have lost five of their last six games and by a margin of 13 plus. So I think the Finns are a fairly safe bet there at some decent value. Warriors versus Knights. If you're not on the Warriors here, take a good hard look at yourself in the mirror, perhaps a potential uppercut as well, because I just see no way that we don't get this done. $1.42 on the nose, and I love them 13 plus at $2.70 as well. The Knights, they haven't won in New Zealand since 2019. That is five rugby league years ago, if my maths is correct. 
And then Dallin, the flying mullet, he scored nine tries in his last eight games at home. Warriors 13 plus into Dell, $3.30. Love that. I also think there's some real jam around our forward pack. I expect us to roll through the middle, build some momentum, and then close to the line. I think we're going to be running that double down line shape where we could well hit some of our forwards. Instead of using them as blockers, we give them the seed and they barge over. Fenor Blake, he's our top try scorer this year, tied with Lukey Met and Dallin. He's still paying five bucks, which is insane. As is Jacko Ford. Always like him to punch over on that edge. Now I think Mitch Barnett against his old team as well. This could be some real jam. I love these guys up against the side they used to play for. A real chip on shoulder, grudge match type of thing. He's paying 10 of the best. Double digits for Big Mitch. Don't mind that at all. Raiders Sharks. I think the Raiders here are real value. $2.45. They're a tough, gritty side. The Sharkies, they shat the bed last week against the Tigers. The Raiders too historically they've won nine of their last 10 against the Sharks. Add to that Jordan Rapana, who really is their spiritual and energy leader. He's playing his 200th game. So I like them there. 1 to 12 as well if you want to extract a little more value. If you want to take the result out of it, Cronulla's last 10 games have all gone the unders. So under 40 and a half points at $1.85 isn't a bad little leg to chuck into your multis as well. Then for your Mad Monday, to round out a big weekend of NRL, you've got the Eels taking on the Tigers. Eels $1.49 favourites and the Tigers they've only won one of their last five games at Combat. It's a welcome back for Mike Acevo who be a welcome boost to an Eels team that's been hit hard by injuries. He scored eight tries in his last eight games against the Tigers. The Tigers, though, shout out to them. They're chasing back-to-back -back wins for the first time since round 10 last year. That's real wooden spoon stuff. So I'll be picking the Eels here, but I don't mind the Tigers to cover the line of plus six and a half. They've covered the line in each of their last three games against Para, so that could be some real jam there at $1.95. In terms of my best multi for your NRL, chuck together a four-legger. Remember, oval ball, mega multi buster promo. If you can miss by one, I'll get my money back as a bonus back. Six plus legs, miss by two. Eight plus legs, you can miss by three. I've gone Warriors minus six and a half on that line. Tigers plus 12 and a half. The Cowboys head to head and the Raiders head to head for the upset. $11.84. I don't know about you, but personally, I was quite surprised by those odds. I thought they were pretty generous so jump on board if you're that way inclined in terms of your super rugby make sure you grab your cotton buds and clean out your eardrums because i hit on my super rugby oval ball mega multi buster last week $4.34 of the best, help yourself. So I'm feeling bullish after that, full of confidence and fizz. I now believe I'm the best punter on planet Earth, so I'm chasing the clean sweep and trying to predict the perfect rounds. I've gone Chiefs head-to-head -head against the Satyrs tomorrow night. No DMAC, but they still get the job done at $1.50. I've gone the Tars over the Rebels at $1.30. The Drawer over the Force in Fiji at $1.27. Blues head-to-head -head over Moana. Although I do think that one has the potential to be reasonably close. Gone the Canes over the Landers at $1.33. The Reds over the Brumbies to bounce back and revenge their loss from last week at $1.70. That's paying $6.04. I get two legs of insurance as well for a bonus back, so I'm certainly riding that one home. Your bet of the week, six from eight this year, going great guns here. Last week she hit Warriors into the Blues, paying $2.21. This week, I'm just going the Warriors and the Raiders head-to-head. Upset is on for the green machine, and it's paying generous, so hopefully that can salute. Seven from nine would be great guns. And then for your magic multi, and I have to apologize for this one, what a wounder. I was three from seven. Last week I said I'm going safe to make it four from eight. Little did I know, I actually chucked in a Wellington Phoenix game that I thought was last weekend. Turns out at this weekend, so last week's Magic Multi is still going. That is an absolute positive. I went the Warriors and the Blues, the two teams from the Big Smoke, and then I chucked in the Phoenix paying $4.33. So that one, she's still alive, but I can't not tip you out something to ride home this week. She won't count towards the tally, though. We're still going to back in last week's one for that. But I do like Warriors 13+, plus, and I like the Houston Rockets today to beat the Oklahoma City Thunder in your NBA. 
day. I'm a big Thunder fan personally. They're probably my second or third favourite team. Do have a soft spot for the Rockets as well. They're missing Sengun, but they've won their last nine games straight and they're playing some great ball at the moment on a real rich vein of form and they're paying $3.15 on the road, which I thought was true overs. So jump on them, multi that up with the Raiders as well. You're going to get $20.83 if you're keen for a little lick on your Magic Multi. But shout out again to the TAB, home of sporting racing, punting here in New Zealand. So get around them. Battler of the Week, brought to you of course by our partners at Better Beer. It's the best beer in all of the land. As the name would suggest, it's better than any other beer in planet Earth. It's got zero carbs, none of this low carb stuff, absolutely none, which makes it a great beer for a day session. So if you're looking for something to sink your teeth into this weekend while you're watching the sport, then I'd recommend you grab yourself a box. They come in the bottles or the cans, and it's always a day for it whenever you're ripping into a couple of better beers. So get amongst it and shout out again to them. This week there were a couple nominations I mentioned before. Albert Opawade burning his arm, not able to play. Similar to that Cam Munster story we heard a couple weeks back. Interesting to note, old Mad Dog Munster, he's talking now that he may not be back at all this year. He's saying it's really touch and go, so the poor bloke is still battling. But this week, I had to go with Benji Marshall's West Tigers, and shout out to them for getting a famous victory. But it was the scenes in the sheds afterwards which really caught my eye. Of course, we always see now cameras cross over to the changing rooms to capture the team victory song. For the Tigers this year, however, notice something slight a little different. All the players holding lyrics to their new song which apparently it turns out Benji had wrote himself. At first before I dove in and did some more investigation I thought it was simply that the Tigers don't win much over the last couple years. They're used to winning spoons but not winning games. You don't sing when you win spoons so I thought perhaps they just weren't aware of the team song, the lyrics because they don't get to belt it out often but it turns out Benji Marshall, Robbie Farah, they've written a new team song for this side they're trying to change the culture at the club so well done to them it was a pretty dusty performance from the lads though when it came to nailing this song lots of them just murmuring they clearly didn't know the words surely you'd run a dress rehearsal pre-season get the lads bonded bang it out a couple times so when that great day does happen and you pull off a famous victory then you can celebrate it in style she was a bit of a shambles all the players looking around at each other and then the song finished with We Are The Tigers, Roar, Roar. Now that is pretty lame. I love you Benji mate, but surely you've got some better lyrics in you than that. I have to say, him rocking up at the press conference post game in a suit was pure class. It shows the bloke, he's just there to clock in, clock out. Really was a business trip and come away with the dub. But shout out to the Tigers. Hopefully by the end of the season you'll be more familiar, more acquainted with that team song and really have nailed down the lyrics. But the fact, you have to print them out to hand them round the sheds post the famous win really just does take some of the gloss off the victory. If that was the mighty coat, all the newbies would know that song already from day one and they would be rearing to rip into it with a couple better bears in hand. So shout out to Benji and the Tigers and like I said, hopefully the first of many dubs this year and you guys can really get familiar with that song. So you're our better bear battlers of the week for this week on your lads and hopefully you enjoy a few tins yourself. Q&A time now before I wrap her up and send you on your merry way. Again, this segment continues to be very popular and really appreciate all your questions. If you follow on Instagram, chuck them in my Instagram story on your Wednesdays when I chuck up that question box. Otherwise, if you're watching along on YouTube, just chuck them in the comments and I'll be sure to get to those as well. The first one from MC Breakfast and he says, Can the Crusaders upset the Chiefs this weekend? Yeah, look, it's tough times. Not many Rob Pennies now lost 10 straight on the bounce listening to Bryn Hall talk there he's starting to lose a bit of faith he's thinking that guy, when guys like Fergus Burke your Barretts your Blackadders and co once they come back into the mixer then that will be their time to shine and saying that though we saw just a couple weeks ago when the Canes went down to Christchurch they got into a real arm wrestle and they were probably quite fortunate to come away with the win there so the Crusaders at home you'd have to be stupid to completely put a line through them especially considering DMAC won't be lacing up 
They're definitely outsiders. A lot will have to go their way. They just look so different of a football side to what we've seen over the last couple years. In all honesty, I think they lose tomorrow night. Then they get that bye that week off, a chance to go soul searching, get a bit of confidence back. And then after that, they head over to Sydney to take on the Tars. Then they take on the Force. One of those two games they will well and truly be targeting. But look, tough time for Crusaders fans. Still don't feel sorry for you, though. You've won so much over the last couple years that it's nice to see you go through just a little bit of pain. NZ Warriors faithful, sticking to your rugby, he says, thoughts on NPC not being televised in 2026. Yeah, this is massive. I think the story came out late last week saying that potentially there hadn't been a new TV rights deal done with NPC and that maybe Sky Sport won't be continuing their coverage of the competition from then on out. If this is the case, then I'm well and truly off it. If you've been listening to this pod for a long time, you know I'm a massive fan of the NPC. Like I always say, without the roots, there is no truth. You got club footy feeds into NPC, then your super and your All Blacks club and NPC. They're arguably the most important for me. I love watching your NPC code, whether it's the Mighty North Harbour or just watching any game that's on in general. This is where you get to see some of that young talent coming through the competition. You can spot them out. Then in a couple years' time, when they're playing in the super sides, playing for the All Blacks, you can say you're a day oneer and you spotted them early doors. Real talent scout type of stuff. Stuff. So fingers crossed this isn't the case and Sky Sport they can front up with a bit of coin to help keep this competition alive because by all means financially it's already struggling and this would probably be the dagger through the heart that could potentially end it. The other thought around it is maybe they move it to that NZR Plus streaming app, which they've been pushing so hard at the moment, bring more revenue there, and then New Zealand Rugby can pump more money into the game. So perhaps it won't be disappearing from our TV screens completely. But for me, I've said it all along, I'd prefer that NPC was our premier domestic competition. We get rid of the Super Rugby sides, All Blacks back in the NPC. We move it forward to your February, March window, pump cash into it, I think people will turn out in droves, play it in your local stadiums, have a game at the Coat, how good would that be, but at Western Springs, have Auckland Harbour there, things like that, get out to the regions, reward them, and I think the punters will reward the provinces with their hard-earned dollars, but NPC needs to be on TV, or we need to be able to watch this in some way in general, so fingers crossed, this was all smoke and mirrors, both teams playing a bit of bluff, trying to get some more money out of each other, and they come to a resolution soon. Next one from Ben Ranger, long-time listener, good to hear from your horse and he says why are we scared to contest up and unders at the moment I think this is in reference to the Warriors and their appeared hesitancy to get up under the high balls off the back of our kicks and I have noticed it over the last couple of weeks and I genuinely think that this is a tactic that Webby and Co have brought into our game in particular we first saw it against Melbourne Storm SJ kicking to Xavier Coates and I touched on it at the time we weren't contesting waiting for him to come down with the ball tackling them early and then not allowing their sets to get started with massive momentum carries from their edges. These days you see their wingers coming in early, tackles one, tackles two, scooting, getting maximum metres against a tired and not quite set D-line and often teams can find themselves at the halfway mark on tackle four which really puts you on the back foot. So it appears this year instead we've opted to play it safe, put it high, let the player come down with the ball, tackle them straight away, it's always their winger, then the opposition winger side, he'll make a carry but after that you're getting into your your centres, your middle forwards who perhaps under a bit more fatigue and not quite as effective in eating up the metres. So I genuinely think this is a tactic from Webby and our kickers. There were times on the weekend though where I will say I thought we could have got up to contest a couple. It is a reasonably low percentage play. You do run the risk of knocking the ball on, allowing them to start off the back of a play the ball or a scrum and they can get into their set structure and really plan out their attack. So I see both sides of the story 
At the moment, though, I believe it's working. I would like to see us go up for it every so often. If we're a genuine chance to pull off the old tap back. And then finally, Corey Parker says, is Tom Ale a better option off the bench than Bunty Arfo? I mentioned Tom Ale and Jazz. I thought they were unlucky to miss out this week. Bunty, though, to his credit, he's been playing really well this year. He looks re-energized. He's carrying hard like he always does. Those trademark back fences. But I think his effort plays around the paddock have been much improved personally I would have gone with Ale or Jazz but I think Bunty he's a quality option a bigger body as well which perhaps gives us a bit more punch Webby in the past has typically played him for around that 20 minute roll he just goes hard foot on throttle hammer and tongs and then subs out Dalian coach of the year Andrew Webster he certainly earned my trust and I think he's done enough to earn the trust of the fans as well I see fans questioning multiple decisions of his every Every week but in Webby we trust guys and no doubt he has a plan for it and he will get the best out of these players so it is what it is and no doubt Jazz and Co will be looking for another big shift in New South Wales Cup to continue to push for that hotly contested 17 jersey in the weeks to come. That draws the curtains on another episode of STS. There's a big few days ahead, so if you're sinking your teeth into all the sporting action this weekend, then I hope you enjoy it. And if you are having a cheeky little flutter, then fingers crossed, you can come up with some dubs. Green ticks on bet slips, that is always the goal, so go well. Actually shooting up north myself, no pre-season code this weekend. The boys went undefeated, two from two, so get the chance to put the feed up. Going to go up, head up to Nangaroo, Matapuri ways, probably play some golf as well there's a cheeky little nine hole course donation box real salt of the earth type of golf so I'll be going there donating my 20 bucks and hopefully not donating too many pro v1s back down on Sunday though of course to head along to the fortress and watch the mighty was so if you're heading along hope to see you there can't wait to be repping the colors loud and proud and watching the boys pull off a famous win go the Chiefs tomorrow night fingers crossed they can continue to pile on the hurt for the crusade and of course get up the mighty blues I think that game against the Moana has the real potential to be an absolute 80 minute barnstormer entertainment deluxe so I can't wait to watch that of course I'll be back here same time same place next Thursday appreciate you all for tuning in go well stay safe how good